for teeth. Okay? That's pretty brutal. But when somebody says, well, our particular religious tenets allow us to punish people like this, at this point in time, the judge would say, that doesn't matter. She has a right to be secure in her person. Okay? Now, that, that particular case actually happened in the Northeast. And in the, in the, and in the case of the Sharia case, this actually happened at a, uh, at a uh, local level. And, it, and I think that you know, when we have a judge who's not a Muslim, or maybe he's not an expert in Sharia law, Whose word is he going to take what Sharia law says, except maybe the person that's standing before him? So when somebody says, well, my particular religion allows me to beat my wife, for example, which is the, what the, the plaintiff used in New Jersey, the judge said, okay, if your religion allows you basically to beat and rape your wife after you were divorced or before you divorced, like I said, I don't have the actual notes in front of me, that particular decision was overturned by an appellate court. This woman wanted a restraining order against her husband who was abusive. The husband said, my particular faith allows, had allowed me to do that when we were married. So the judge said, okay, then I'm not going to issue the restraining order. Now, that, was a, that was the wrong decision. The judge should have given that woman a restraining order because she has a right to be protected in, in her property, in herself, and in, in her ability to maintain safety. Now, like I said, that was overruled at the appellate level, so the higher judge ruled the right way, but it should not have happened to begin with at the lower level. So there's a case from... There's a case from uh, maybe the Muslim community, and like I said, I'm not an expert in that case, I wasn't there, but it's also a case from outside of the, of the Muslim community as well, because I'm, I'm trying to be fair. Okay. Well, for a quick example, wouldn't that have been an error on the judge and not the law? No, you're right, the judge was wrong, but you see, if the state legislature had made sure to reinforce the principle of the spirit of the law, that, that you can't just tell people, you can't protect this First Amendment and allow that First Amendment right to freedom of religion, violate somebody else's right to be safe, okay? Because the spirit of the law means that everybody should be free and secure in their person. So if this law had been applied up there and said you can't apply foreign law if it would deprive somebody of their freedom or their safety? Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this guy was just taking the word. The guy said it's, it's appropriate for me to assume that this guy is telling me that it's okay to be his wife. That's an error on the judge. It's not an error. You're, you're right. You're right. But still, had this law been used as the public policy, it wouldn't have happened. How do you know that? That's not true because this is based on the judges. If I can response. interrupt, um, <laughs> we, we can have one person ask a question at a time. It's not really a, a, it's not really a debate match or something. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, since it's the legislative branch's job to write the laws and the judicial branch's uh, job to interpret the law, even if this law is in effect, wouldn't it still be the judge's decision anyway? Oh, yeah. And I think that's very similar to her question. If this law was there, wouldn't it still be the judge's decision? Yes, but at that point, the judge would be in violation of an actual articulated policy telling him that he cannot do that. So it's already in law. So now, now so, I would assume that the judge in that particular case would be facing criminal charges. So there's already, there's already rules that would be broken yeah, if, if he I did it incorrectly. It's very important that you ask a question, allow him to answer, and then not interrupt that question. And this is the way a form is done, and this is the rule that I will enforce. So if anybody else has a question, please feel free to answer it. Uh, are you finished answering the question? You can finish answering the, the judge, The judge could violate this, and I think from time to time, judges already probably violate the law, or maybe their interpretation is so broad that it defeats the purpose of the law in the first place. But I think that with the application of foreign law in particular cases that we've seen in this particular trend, I think that it would be a good idea to make sure that we articulate to our judges in the state of Missouri saying whenever you apply foreign law, here's something else to reconsider. Make sure that it does not deprive somebody else of a fundamental liberty. That's the whole purpose and intent of this bill. If I may, uh, the brother in the back, he asked, raise his hand? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, coming here and sharing this uh, uh, the whole uh, the debate about this. Uh, actually, you, you, you said that you didn't know the whole uh, uh, information about that, that case, but as far as I know, that there's not in any place in the Sharia law says that you know some husband after the after the divorce they should beat her or anything like that. I would like to uh, brother Shakir to to allow this. Yeah. If I hear correctly, that judge in New Jersey, uh, I mean, if this is, if the case is as simple as that, 
that uh, the gentleman, you know, told the judge, okay, according to Sharia, I have the right to beat my my wife, and she granted him the right, and okay, case dismissed. <laughs> this is very naive, really. I mean, there is no way that this judge deserved to be in that chair. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So we should not really take an anomaly. If this is the case, we should not take an anomaly and spread it like a fire in, in the hay. You know, this is, and, and our judges make mistakes, you know, thousands of times every day. You go and read about Sharia in Oklahoma. Last night I spent maybe three hours reading exactly the higher court, the reasoning and the analysis and how they overturned, you know, the, the ruling. So you could really see that, yes, we have brilliant judges, but at the same time we have very naive judges, very lazy judges, maybe just like lazy lawyers who are sleeping in the courtroom, you know? So we have all of those. So we should not take an anomaly, an example, and magnify it and, and state a law. Tell me another example, because I am telling you here uh, from knowledge that there is no way in Sharia that this is the case. I mean, how could, how could that happen, you know? And then I cannot imagine that a judge in a U.S. court sit and believe at least he should call you know, the, the mosque and say, I have a friend who is an imam somewhere in one of the, one of the states. He is so knowledgeable about Sharia to the extent, and he has a huge community, thousands of people from different corners of the Muslim world. And the judge at the end told every two disputing Muslims, go to the sheikh so-and-so, let him, you know, arbitrate between you, give me a written, signed, authorized document from him, authorized document from him, and this is my ruling. He trusts that sheikh absolutely. So if we, two individuals, could resolve our, our dispute outside the court, I don't know what is the business of the, of the judge as long as we really both are happy with that. Let me give you an example. We marry according to Islam, but in our Islamic center, we will not even initiate the marriage contract without seeing a marriage contract from the county. This is our policy. They have to go, the couple has, has to go there, bring the document, and we will have to uh, initiate the procedure for an Islamic marriage. In Islamic marriage, we have a closet where dowry, the man should give a dowry to his wife. If this is in agreement between both husband and wife, and this bill passes, tomorrow there is a divorce, this lady cannot go to the judge and claim, hey, I have a 10,000 dowry, this is my right. The judge will tell her, well, this is a foreign law, I cannot apply it, I'm sorry. This is, this is a piece of paper that, is, that does not mean anything for me. So, I seconded this young lady here, I admire her to see, to ask, Give me a practical example where this law is going really to benefit our society. Are we wasting our time here? In my opinion, we are probably not, because we have an opportunity to educate the public what Sharia is and what Sharia is not. Sharia is not to deprive women from their rights, from their freedom, absolutely not. God has given us both, men and women, equal right equal responsibilities. We are two different genders, yes. But that does not mean that in the sight of the Almighty Creator that we are going to uh, be judged differently. No, every one of us is going to stand there and to answer for her or his uh, deeds on, uh, on earth. He said, time is finished, and if you have more questions for me, please go forward and ask. Any other questions? If there are no more questions, just please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, my, my name is uh, Representative Stephen Weber, and I just wanted to speak briefly before you wrapped it up because I just wanted to. I think it's important that you know um, who the people. Or what the people that represent you, what they're, what they're doing for you, and what they believe. First, I want, I want to thank Paul Kerman. I, I really appreciate you coming um, here to Columbia, and, and uh, thank you very much for making me feel welcome here. Uh, it's, it's always good to put a good face on our hometown and make sure that, that people are welcome to come here. 
Um, I personally am against this bill. And I want you to know, um, as your representative, that I, I'm going to vote against it. And one of the major reasons, I think we had a very good debate uh, tonight. <laughs> I think we had a very good debate tonight, but I think the questions uh, got to what my major concern with it is, is that I don't see a public benefit from it. I think all the examples, um, the examples provided, uh, I think are covered under under the current well under the current constitution. Um, you know, the Mennonite example, you, you are not allowed under current law uh, to hurt somebody anyway. There's, there's, there's no situation where that would be okay. It's illegal under Missouri law to give somebody permission to hurt you. You can't do it. It's not allowed under current law. And so any religious law will have to go through the test, as it currently does, of the United States Constitution, the state constitution, and the state statutes. So I don't see this changing that in any way. What I do see it doing um, is polarizing, uh, dividing people, and, and making it more difficult um, for normal, everyday things to happen already. There is always a battle, there always will be a battle about, in the courts about what religious freedom means. Uh, that's going on from the dawn of time. The Constitution, you know, the First Amendment says we have a right to religious freedom, and yet there are still, every religion faces restrictions on what you're allowed to do under the secular law of the United States. The way that we decide what, what trumps the First Amendment or, or the rights of others um, is by working our way through the court process. Uh, that's what we've been doing. Sometimes the court may make us, in our opinion, may make a mistake, but it's something we respect. And I don't think we should tinker with that process. I think it works well. And I, I am thrilled that so many folks in Columbia uh, care enough to come out. And I just want you to be aware, um, you know, as, as your representative, what I'm doing for you. And it, I'm, some folks came down to, uh, to my office a couple weeks ago, um, and they were, they were very, uh, very articulate. They, they explained some of the issues with it, and I appreciate them doing that. Um, and so I just wanted you to hear it directly from somebody who represents you. Please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, we're actually going to wrap it up. I do want to give the mic to John because uh, he has a few words to say, and then I'm going to wrap it up, and then we'll be able to go. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you again for your hospitality. but. But mostly I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Representative Kurtman. Um, obviously we disagree about this bill and the interpretation of its effects, but I think that it was um, an honorable and, and an awesome thing actually for him to come here and address you. I think it showed a lot of goodwill. And I think that this... I think this is just the perfect example of how our political system works at its best, and so I thank you and thank him both. I think uh, I think I know I'm the minority in this room, <laughs> but uh, just different than uh, the way it is on the floor, but. Um, but, but, I, but, but I just, what I want to say is that my, my intent behind this bill, in spite of what some people might make of something like this, because you could really kind of take this bill and attack the application of foreign law through any other system, uh, corporate system or whatever. And I think that, especially since the events on 9-11, I think that there's been a particular stigma among the American population about what they know about Sharia law or the Muslim faith um, in, in general. And uh, I think that there's a lot of misinformation and miseducation out there. But my intent behind this bill is re solely to protect fundamental liberties. And fundamental, I, think I've, I think I've done a pretty good job of explaining my intent behind this bill. Because I, I believe that regardless of your faith, regardless of uh, what you own or the color of your skin or anything like that, I, I sincerely believe that we're all created equal with the same amount of liberty and that the proper function and role of government is to make sure that we're doing our best to protect people's God-given liberty. And sometimes governments get it wrong, sometimes America gets it wrong, but, uh, but, but that's literally, and quite honestly, and genuinely my intent behind this bill. So, but thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and, and, and at least share my <laughs> thank you.
All right, with that, I would like to say um, thank you so much to John Chastan for coming. Thank you so much for Shakira Alani for uh, letting us know about Sharia and also being very passionate when he speaks. And special, special <laughs> thanks for Representative Paul Kirkman for agreeing to come here. Really, it is um, very, as John's mentioned, like it's very uh, amazing. It shows the greatness of America that you know we can have these types of dialogue, we can have these types of discussions, and they'll come.